Amen, brother. Amen. I'm still here. Amen. Okay. Hey. Um, yeah, it's been fantastic. And, uh, you know, anytime I go to Bible believing churches in these last uh, little over three years that I've been out, it's, I've, man, I've lost count of how many churches. I got to, I got to re, gotta re uh, add them up. But it's always like coming home. It's always so familiar. Um, it, it and then when I I'm only here a short time, but then it's you know bittersweet that I that that I have to leave because I make so many great friendships and meet so many really super cool people, and it's just like being home. And and there you know and that's not in all Christian churches, but in our in our crowd in our, our stripe in our Bible believing churches, folks are just different. And, and but they're different. But everywhere you go, they're the same. So that's a, uh, you know, that's a conundrum right there. Um, I, I noticed something uh, um, where you had the, the young people uh, coming up and, 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 and putting offerings in the box over there. At our church uh, in Las Vegas, Bible Baptist Church, Las Vegas, Nevada, my pastor is Mitch Service. Um, we have, a, a, you know, one of those like a table right here in front of the pulpit, you know, with the flowers and a big open Bible on it. But the the offering plates sit at the ends of that table. And when we do the offering, we don't have ushers. Uh, our children are the ushers. And so when the offering song starts, all the kids just get up and they're just running all over the place, getting everybody's money, running it down and dumping it in the thing, then running back and gathering it up. And, and it's just, it's a show in itself to watch these kids, you know, make, having so much fun and, you know, ingraining in them that, that principle of giving like that. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's just super cool. That's super cool. Uh, tonight, uh, uh, I want to talk about the God of better. The God of better. So um, uh, you're going to get a better message tonight because uh, 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 I'm not going to be talking about me this <laughs> like I was this morning. Amen. No, uh, we're going to actually we're going to be talking about our King James Bible tonight. So if you will uh, go with me, let's start. And I think uh, I think I was in Hebrews chapter six. Yes, that's that's where we were at. OK, Hebrews chapter six. And the ninth verse, and we'll just launch from there. We're going to go a bunch of places. Don't have to turn every every reference if you're not a fast Bible turner person. All right. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 9. Apostle Paul writes, and yes, Paul did write Hebrews. Apostle Paul writes, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we come and, and Lord, we just, again, the first thing is thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the blood. Uh, Lord, thank you for your book. Didn't help me to talk about it tonight. Uh, take, take this old jailbird from the slammer out of the way and uh, somehow, some way, uh, uh, let me uh, uh, speak words that would encourage, edify, and build the faith of, uh, of the brethren here in this church. And thank you for this church. And thank you for this pastor. And thank you for his family. And uh, thank you for all these young people I got to meet in here and, uh, and, and old folks too, Lord. And um, this, uh, this whole time, Lord, has just been, been wonderful uh, here in the Detroit area and with all three churches. And I uh, just thank you for this mountaintop experience. And uh, now just be with us in these next few minutes. And we'll give you all the honor, glory, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So he says uh, uh, better things. Better things. So we serve a God of better things. Amen. And uh, I'm not going to turn. I've got them written down, so I'm not going to turn there. You don't have to turn there either. But uh, you're going through the book of Hebrews and there's a whole list of better things. Uh, he talks in Hebrews chapter one and verse four about uh, uh, Jesus being better than the angels. And uh, in chapter seven, verse seven is better than the Old Testament priests. In uh, chapter 7, 19, he brings in a better hope. Um, in uh, 
chapter 7, verse 22, a better testament. Uh, chapter 8, verse 6, a better covenant. Uh, and then in chapter 9, verse 23, that's connected with better sacrifices. Um, he came, uh, chapter 11, verse 35, he came to prepare you for a better resurrection. Uh, in chapter 11, verse 16, to a better country. And uh, it has 1140 that has a better inheritance. So we see all through the Bible that he's a God of better and that Jesus comes and he brings better and we have better. Uh, but you can turn with me if you want to this one, Second Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, well, let's, let's go back to verse 16. Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his, his majesty. For we received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount and of course he is relating the event where Peter, James, and John were taken apart with the Lord Jesus Christ, what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, where the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, his veil of flesh was pulled back momentarily, and his resurrection, eternal glory, shone forth for a moment. And Peter, James, and John saw it. Moses and Elijah appeared with him. The, uh, uh, the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit was glowing all around, and the voice of the Father was speaking from heaven. You could call that a, a, a close encounter of the God kind. Amen. I mean that that was that's 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 some that's some wild stuff there, man. Wild stuff, man. I mean, you've got the Lord Jesus Christ, not just in his uh, in his role. His Philippians role where, you know, he yeah, that who became flesh became like us. Uh, let this mind be also you and you which in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not ro robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of the service. We're not talking about uh, like at, at his baptism where he was the lowly Galilean who had laid aside all his power and glory. And yes, the voice of the Father was there. And yes, the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit was visibly there. But in this instant, it is not the lowly Galilean that is being revealed here in this instant his 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 eternal glory is being previewed his shall we say his advent glory this is a a fast forward a preview of the glorious appearing the second coming when he comes in power and glory and and he's his raiment is white as glow as as snow and he, and he's shining and Moses and Elijah they're with him man this is this is some second coming stuff this is some this is this is just as good as it gets, right? I, I mean, you just can't get more of a close encounter of the God kind and then this, could you? Could you? Let's read on. Verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. What? What do you mean a more sure word of prophecy? You mean more sure than the Lord Jesus Christ exhibiting his, his second advent glory. The, 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 oh, I'm not even going to use the word Shekinah because it's not biblical. That, but, but, the, but the manifest presence of the Holy Ghost, just like appeared in Solomon's temple, was present. And the voice of the Father himself from heaven speaking... And you will tell me there's a more sure word of prophecy than that? Say more sure. Another word for that would be better? <laughs> What's better than that? 
<laughs> What's better than what we just looked at right there? He said, we also have, verse 19, a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well, that you take heed. Hmm? Better pay attention. <laughs> you do well that you take heed, as unto a light, that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What is this better thing? Verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God says that the scripture, the inspired scripture is better than what they, what they experienced on the Mount of Transfiguration. A God of better. What I got in my hand is better than any experience that anybody could have. Because you know what? Experiences fade. Experiences alter in your mind. They change over years. Feelings, emotions, experiences. Listen. Feelings are deceptive. Feelings come and feelings go. And feelings are deceiving. Our warrant is the word of God. Nothing else is worth believing. So the word of God, the word of God says, is better than all the Old Testament appearings, all the experiences that the Hebrews had, all of the experiences that the Apostles and disciples had with the Lord when he was here on earth. God says that he has exalted his word above all his name. Better, better, better. But we can get more specific. We can get more specific because we could say the word of God or or the Bible, and that leaves a whole lot of blank space that somebody could fill in with pretty much anything they want, and that's what Laodicean Christianity has done today, right? The Bible. And I tell you what, there's a whole lot of books, a couple hundred of them in the English language that they're out there, and they wrote Bible on the cover, and boy, they're, they're no more a Bible than Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. So he says, it's better. It's a more sure word of prophecy. Why is it more sure? Why? Psalms 12, 6, and 7. I know y'all familiar with this. I know y'all know this verse. huh? Psalms 12, 6, and 7. The words, plural, W-O-R-D-S. The words, not just the thought, not the word, not the, just the thought, not just the gospel, but the words, the inspires, the W-O-R-D-S, the words, each and every word, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them for how long? From this generation and forever. So, this better thing that God's talking about, that's better than the Old Testament, that's, that's better than Earth's Christ, uh, the Christ's earthly ministry, that's better than any experiences Old Testament saints or apostles or anybody had, this, this, this inspired scripture that he says is better, he says consists of words, and he said that they are words that... Seven, purified seven times God's number of perfection and completion. These are words that have been perfectly, perfectly purified. And he said he's going to preserve them from this generation forever. So we've got absolutely, 100%, perfectly purified, preserved words. 
He's going to preserve from this word, from this generation forever. Now, that has to include translation. There's inspiration, there's preservation, there's translation. Listen, what would inspiration be without preservation? Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. I do a message. I don't, have, I don't, know, I don't want to pick up my notes. But I have a message where I keep a, pa, a, pa, a, a stack of papers here. And I say, what, what did God do? He, he just had all, these, had all these prophets write all this inspired stuff down. And I, I throw that whole stack of paper out. And then he goes, okay, <laughs> do the best you can with it. I'll be back in a couple thousand years. God had nothing to do with the, with the preservation. God had nothing to do with the translation. You know what I call that? I call that Bible atheism. There's about as much faith in that as there is an atheist believing in evolution. You don't believe? You tell me you don't believe God was interested and involved in each intricate detail of preserving that word that he inspired? So, in, so the inspiration of the word of God is absolute nonsense without the preservation of the word of God. Now, here's where you're going to run into your trouble. <laughs> here's where you're going to, they say separate the men from the boys. Here's where you're, going to, where you're going to separate the Bible believers from the Bible atheists. Preservation doesn't make any sense without translation. Preservation don't make any sense without translation. Who speaks ancient Hebrew? Who speaks Koine Greek? Eh, a little bit. Made, it made us do in Bible college. But, hey, these are dead languages. You know, there's some people in, in Greece that speak a modern Greek. There's some Hebrews that speak a modern Hebrew. But, I mean, for the most part, how would he preserve his word like that? And he didn't. He translated it. And God can do that. God's big enough to do that. And if we're going to have each and every word, Isaiah, he said, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. So if we're going to get each and every word in a book. That book has got to be in one language. Just saying. Because they got it, they got the Hebrew, Hebrew Old Testament over here. They got a Greek New Testament over here. But if we're going to have a book of the Lord that somebody can seek out, it's going to have to be put together in one language. And that means we're going to have to translate it. All right. Now, again, this is only going to apply to Bible believers. We have thus far in the meetings I've spoken about here talked about hermeneutics. Uh, the laws of biblical interpretation. And we've talked about, we were talking about hell. We talked about repetition, right? The law of repetition. God repeats stuff for emphasis. And then when we were talking about the blood, we were talking about the law of first mention, where God sets the basic tone, association, and meaning of a word by its first mention in the scripture. But there's another one I'm going to throw at you here, is the law of complete mention. That means that you don't need to go outside the source of the word of God itself to any dictionary, to any scholar, to any church father, to any church tradition. You don't need to go there to define what the book already defines in itself. So let's use the law of first mention and let's use the law of complete mention and we'll see what the book itself says about translation. Go with me to 2 Samuel 310. Now we'll do complete mention and first mention because this is the first mention of translate. Second, Second Samuel 310. We're talking about with David, Saul, and David, and we back up a little bit. And verse 9, so, so do God to Abner and more also, except as the Lord hath sworn to David, even so I do to him. Verse 10, to what? Translate the kingdom from the house of Saul 
and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan even to Beersheba. So first mention, translate. We're translating the kingdom from Saul to the throne of David. Was it better before it was translated? Was it better after it was translated? The throne of Saul or the throne of David? Huh? It was better. It was a God of better. It was a better throne after it was translated. Colossians 1.13. Now we're going to do we're doing complete mention. What are the what my 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 good friend evangelist Cliff Taylor often says? What do the Bible say? What do the Bible say? Well, let's see what the Bible says. Complete mention translation, and that's Colossians chapter one and verse thirteen. Colossians 1, and where am I? Oh, there it is, all right. We talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, who hath delivered God, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and has what? Translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, of course, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So, translated from the kingdom of God, darkness, into the kingdom of his dear son. Was it better before the translation or was it better after the translation? After. It's better. It's better after it's translated. That's two. Hebrews 11.5. See, you go, you go to a bunch of secular sources, they're not, you're not going to get this. You're only going to get this from a King James Bible. Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11, 5 says, and we got it kind of twice in two forms in this verse. It says, by faith, Enoch was what? He was translated that he should not see death. Amen. So <laughs> Enoch was translated. <laughs> you think his, his situation was better before or after he was translated? Come on. Come on now. Come on now. All right. And they said, because God, because God had translated him uh, before, I'm sorry, three times in here. Before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So there, there's the word again three times. And what was translated was better after it was translated. All right. So that's just taking the word as it's used in the Bible. And instead of going to what Dr. Bottle Stopper or Dr. Smell Fungus has to say about it, we just go see what the Bible says about it. And there's a really good example of that in uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 36. I'm sure your pastor's taught on this before. Jehudi's pen knife. And we won't stay there long. But you see that they brought... They, Jeremiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he he he, he writes has his uh, uh his Barak his right hand man, uh, uh verse seventeen and and they said Barak uh, uh saying uh, tell us how how didst thou write all these all these words at his mouth and Barak answered he pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth and I wrote them with ink in a book all right so there we got it we got the book we got the book we got the words the words that God inspired and everything right there and then of course what happens uh, uh they get there in front of the king and uh, uh they were you know they they were they were a bunch of doctor bottle stoppers and doctor smell fungus and bible atheists and uh they they did not like the authority of these words so what did they do the same thing the modern scholars do today uh, it says in verse 23 and it came to pass that when jehudi had read three or four leaves he cut it with the pen knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the 
the roll was consumed in the fire uh, that was on the hearth. <laughs> Yet they were not afraid. And they're not afraid to put out 200 books and call them a Bible when they're not a Bible either. Uh, and uh, so we fast forward and uh, to verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Barak, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah, all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire. And there were added besides unto them many like words. So after it was destroyed and redone under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, what came out was what? It was better. He got, there, there was more there. There was stuff in there that wasn't in the first one. But, but God wrote both of them. It wasn't a, this wasn't a, like, like a New King James or ESV or, or something that was a work of man. No, this, this is God involved in the original and it's God involved in the translation. It's better. It's better. Let's give you a couple of little examples right here. Isaiah has 66 chapters. Your King James Bible has 66 books. If you go to chapter 1 of the book of Isaiah, and the first book of the Bible, you will find that they match. They talk about that God created the heavens and the earth. Chapter 1, first book of the Bible. Then you go 39 books to the last book of the Old Testament, and you get to the 39th chapter of Isaiah, and you'll find they're both talking about Israel going into captivity. Then you go to the 40th book of the Bible, which would be the 40th chapter of Isaiah. You know what they both say? The voice of one crying in the wilderness. <laughs> Amen. Make, make straight the paths for our God. And then we'll fast forward all the way to Isaiah chapter 66 and the 66th uh, uh, book of the Bible, which is Revelation. You know what they both say? A new heavens and a new earth. Amen. Hey, guess what? In the Greek, I mean, and in the Hebrew, there were no chapter divisions. There were no verse number divisions. That wasn't in the Hebrew and the Greek. That's only in your King James Bible. You know why? It's better. It's better. When he translated, it's better. It, it got stuff the Greek and the Hebrew didn't have. New stuff. This book is perfect. The words of your King James Bible have such a absolute, minute, mathematical formula of perfection that you can go to the next level, the next level. I May I commend to you, my friend, Brandon Peterson. His YouTube channel is Truth is Christ, and his book is sealed by the king. And the guy's a mathematical genius. He's breaking new ground, but he's breaking this stuff down that's in your King James Bible. It's not in any of these 200 fake modern English Bibles that have come out, and it's not in the Greek, and it's not in the Hebrew, but in your King James Bible, everything is divisible by seven. The term, in Christ, 77 times, seven times 11. Baptize all forms, 77 times, seven times 11. Amen, with a capital A, 77 times, seven times 11. Rock, capital R, seven times. Thus saith the Lord, 49 times, seven times seven. Word of God, 49 times, seven times seven. Lord God, 14 times, two times seven. Jehovah, seven times. The Word with a capital W, seven times. Gospel of God, seven times times my beloved son seven times spirit of christ and god 28 four times seven forgive 56 eight times seven forgiven 42 six times seven forgiveness seven times reconciled seven times confessed seven times sanctified seven times finished 42 times six times seven 
rested 21 times, three times seven, and the end of the world seven times. The 77th time the word church shows up, it just happens to be in Laodicea, the last church. Now what are we? Witnesses, 49 times, seven times seven. We're the bride, 14 times, two times seven. Your King James Bible has the word blood 447 times. It has the word sin 447 times. There's enough blood in your King James Bible to cover every single one of your sins. You know what the new versions do? They take the blood out and there's more sin in them than there is blood to cover them. This book is better. This book will correct any Greek, any Hebrew manuscript or collection of manuscripts that are the, the best effort work of fallen man, science falsely so called, enticing words of man's wisdom, which many are befuddled and mesmerized and fascinated with. That's the flesh. That's pride. That's enticing words of man's wisdom. Listen, it's just maybe I'm just maybe I'm just backwards and simple enough to, to think that God would keep his promise and preserve a perfect book, and my God is big enough to do it. And, I, and these people don't believe the book. They don't believe there's a perfect Bible. I said, What kind of God you got? What kind of God you got that couldn't give you a perfect Bible? And you know what? Without that kind of faith, believe in every word of this book, you're not going to know this book. If you don't believe the words of the book, you're not going to receive the words of the book. There's always going to be an element of doubt. Well, actually, in the Greek, I think that really should have said this. And now you could, hey, that's what these 200 Bibles are. It's Burger King, Burger King Bible. Have it your way. If you don't like what it says, just go find a version that says something you like. Or if, if that doesn't work for you, just go find a Greek lexicon that translates the Greek in such a way that it's pleasing to you. And you can pick one from over here and you can pick one from over here and you can stick them together. And in the final and final analysis, get what? Guess what? You're still the final authority, not God. Your feelings, your emotions, your desires, your experiences. And where does that come from? Huh? Might sound familiar. I will ascend. I will. Huh? That, that is just wicked, sinful human nature. This is the father of Bible atheism. Bible atheism. So if you do not believe every word of this book, you will not know this book. So what do we got now? We've got a bunch of people that were taught things from books that are not Bibles by people who don't know the Bible and therefore run around with a head full of error thinking they know something about the Bible. And they don't. They don't know how to rightly divide. They don't know the difference between the church and Israel. They don't know the difference between standing and state. They don't know the difference between body, soul, and spirit. They don't know the difference between Jew, Gentile, and the church of God. They don't, wouldn't know a dispensation if it slapped them in the face. Because they don't believe the words of this book. This book talks about the importance of doctrine. All right? 1 Timothy 4.13. 1 Timothy 4 and 13 says... Till I come, till I come, give attendance, what, to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. <coughs> to doctrine. 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, 
That verse does not read like that in any other Bible but a King James Bible. It doesn't say study, and it doesn't say rightly divide. It doesn't. So if you don't have a King James Bible, number one, you don't know that how you study is to rightly divide. You don't know that there are some right divisions in the Bible. And if you don't rightly divide the Bible, you're going to end up in error. And you're not going to know that those right divisions are called dispensations. And I won't read them all right now for the sake of time. 1 Corinthians 9, 14, Ephesians 1, 10, Ephesians 3, 2, and Colossians 1, 25. The Apostle Paul talks about dispensations. Because people talk about covenant theology and and all millennial theology, that ain't even in the Bible. But I'll tell you what is in the Bible. Dispensations are in the Bible. Amen. So we need to know study. And how do we study? We rightly divide. And how do we rightly divide? By dispensation. Why? Because those are the words that are in the Bible. And guess what? If you don't have a King James Bible, you don't have those words. So you're not going to know how to study. You're not going to know your Bible. Doctrine is important. Doctrine matters. The word doctrine is in your King James Bible 51 times. Hmm? You know the, law, the law of repetition. God repeats stuff for emphasis. God emphasizes doctrine, 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 doctrine. He emphasizes it. What do the new Bibles do? Well, the, 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 ne the next down the line is your new King James Doctrine's only in there 36 times. The Amplified, doctrine's only in there 32 times. The American Standard Version, doctrine's only there 17 times. The Revised Standard Version, doctrine's only there 13 times. The ESV, doctrine's only there 11 times. NIV, five times. What seems like there would be, a, there is a sinister intelligence behind these new Bibles that doesn't want you to know doctrine, that doesn't want you to know that you need to rightly divide, doesn't want you to know what dispensations are, doesn't even want you to study. It wants you to go on your feelings and your emotions and your experiences. But can I tell you <laughs> about them feelings and them emotions and them experiences? And there's a more sure word of prophecy. There's a more sure word of prophecy when the feelings are gone, when the emotions let you down, when the experiences fade to memory in old age. <laughs> this word is settled forever in heaven. This will not change. You can, bet, you can bet your life on it. You can bet your hope of eternity on it. You can bet each and every moment of each and every day. Even, hey, this is crazy. You all heard my testimony this morning. Even when I was in the midst, the worst midst of my mess, Running from God, I still didn't doubt that this, I still knew this was, this was his word. I was running from it, but I still knew it. And you know what? When you know truth, it changes how you view everything in the world. It changes how you behave in every situation and circumstance that comes your way. When you know what's, hey, when you know what's going on. You always know say that in prison? Man, you know what time it is? You know what time it is? You know what's up? Hey, if you know these words, you know what's up. And other people don't. They're confused. They're in darkness. They got fake Bibles, and they're, they got fake teachers, and they think they know something, and they don't. So as we get to these last and evil days, to this day of the remnant, Right? This is this church is this is a pretty this is a pretty big church compared to a lot of churches I preach in. A lot of churches I preach in, Bible believing churches, our kind of churches, and they don't they don't have a Sunday night service like this. Man, this would be a big for a big crowd for a Sunday morning service. I preach I preach in churches with three people. And I and I talk to pastors, they're discouraged. Brother Roy, I just don't know this. Nobody cares anymore. We knock on doors. We, well, he goes, but nobody's coming. And, and it was always going to be like this. It was always going to be like this right before he comes back. Because the main harvest, you've got the, the first fruits, you've got the main harvest, and then you've got the gleanings, right? 
So we had the first fruits. We had the main harvest. King James Bible. God took, God took the Greek Old Testament. I mean, sorry. He took the Hebrew Old Testament. He took the Greek New Testament. And in, in, in a period of time, when the British Empire ruled the known world, the printing press had just come into common usage so people could actually have a book. People were learning how to read. God took that Hebrew Old Testament. He took that Greek New Testament. And he put them together in one perfect Bible in the universal language of the end times when the British Empire ruled the known world and then he took the British Empire and America and put that book into the hands of missionaries and sent that book across the globe and brought the gospel of Jesus Christ to every nation on this planet. That's what God did. That's the fruit of this book. That's what God did. But now the main harvest, that was the, the that, man, that's when we had the big revivals. We had the big movements of God. You can read about them. It's exciting church history and stuff of it. Whitfield and Wesley and I mean, all the Billy Sunday. And I mean, you, man, with thousands of people, thousands of people getting saved, huge meetings, packed churches. I mean, when I got saved, that churches were still there for full of people, even back in the 80s. But see, the field has been mostly harvested now. So where are we at now? We're just in the gleanings. This one over here. One over here. All right. Ain't like it used to be. But it was always going to be like that at the end. Don't let, that be a, don't let that be a discouragement to you. Don't let that be a surprise to you. Hey, when you see all these things come to pass, look up. <laughs> hey, but hey, what we got to do, we got to occupy till he comes. Because guess what? There are still those gleanings out there. And look, we're not Calvinistic here, but Jesus knows who's going to accept him and who's not going to accept him. And look, at he's not going to say the body of Christ is full and we're out of here until that last kernel of corn is in. So, you know, we're just a remnant. And I, I firmly believe that the, that the remnant in this day and age are those that are staying true to the book. Bible-believing churches. I'm not saying other folks ain't saved. I'm just saying those that are really in the light, in the truth, doing the work, remaining faithful, occupying until he comes, are King James Bible believers. So we just stay faithful. We stand by this book. And even though all, all of Christianity looks at us like we're two-headed monsters or the, the re retarded red-headed cousin or something, I mean, they, you know, look, look at, we are not popular. But those that proclaim the truth throughout the scripture were never popular. Hey, because, because it's God's message. Man likes its own, man likes his own message. Huh? And man's problem is that they can't understand everything I just said. It, their problem isn't right here. Their problem is a heart. That's the world's problem today. And that's why you have such opposition and nobody... Listen, it's, it's not they don't understand uh, what you're telling them. It's they don't want to know it. The problem is the heart. It's an evil heart of unbelief. It is the spirit of the age. And as we were talking about this morning in the Sunday school hour, that, hey, it, these are the last times, many antichrists, the spirit of antichrist is already at work. Hey, he's getting ready to blossom. The spirit of antichrist is coming to the point of his fruition. But we're going to be out of here before that happens. But until then, we still got a God of better, and we still got a better book than any Hebrew, than any Greek, than anything else. We have a perfect Bible. And I, what I hold in my hand, and I'll close with this, and you can stand firm on this. If you don't believe, as firm as I know I'm saved and going to heaven, I know this to be the truth. And here's something you can take to the bank. What I hold in my hand right here is the only 100% pure and perfect thing on the face of planet Earth. 
Believe that. Believe that.